want to remind you guys that there are a few conditions like highly cat catabolic states. Like let's say you have a really bad burn or you, you have an infection or let's say you're acute infection. Another another scenario where the DON may go up is when the patient is bleeding. I don't know if you've seen a GI bleed in the hospital. If you pay attention to the creatinine, DUN creatinine ratio, these patients they tend to have a pretty high DUN. And again, it's not necessarily related to renal failure, but I just want you to expand your differential. If you want to see a high DUN, it can be because the patient is catabolic, it can be because the patient is very dehydrated. So we call that how do we call that in medicine? Can you we call that pre-renal, right? Pre-renal hypertemia. Hypertemia is basically related to a high one. And uh, we also see that in, 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 in some ways like in steroids. If you pay attention to the labs and just you have a patient that you see in here is that the cardiovascular institute. And the patient is taking prednisone, take a look at the labs, take a look at the UN, invariably it's gonna be high. So the bottom line is that the UN we use it, um, but we use it we use it as a piece of information to come up with the differential diagnosis. You don't just use it all oh, because it's high, so this patient is, is pre-renal. No, this patient may be having a GIP or it may be, may be having a high catabolic state. Okay, so... Is, is there a certain number for the creatinine that you're looking at? Or is it like an elevation or... Excellent question. So the creatinine is, is a muscle protein, so we have to have that in mind when we make our interpretation. If you have a 75-year-old, very frail, elderly female, with a creatinine of 1.5, that lady probably has a severe, a severe renal dysfunction. So you have this same, the same individual, I'm sorry, the same, uh, the same number with a totally different individual, like let's say a 35 year old African American male with a lot of muscle. That's completely normal for that person. And that's what it, it comes down to understanding. Another example, a cirrhotic patient. If they give you a patient, a cirrhotic patient, a creatinine of 1.8, that patient is probably in a renal failure. And why? Because they don't have muscle. You take a look at, you pay attention to a cirrhotic patient, you have enough muscle. So that's that's why it's important that we always interpret these things. The National Kidney Foundation came up with a classification, and you've probably heard of it, like stage one to stage five kidney disease. So that classification has been in place probably for the last 15 years. And uh, the reason why they did it was to raise awareness on the, on the non-nephrology providers to to identify and to refer those patients to the nephrologist to, you know, to work them up if necessary. Um, that, I think that classification is good because it's simple, it's easy to remember. You guys probably remember that stage 1 is the less severe, stage 5 is the most severe, when the patient is GFR is less than 15, call that stage 5. When the GFR is like 16 to 29, we call that stage 4. When it's 30 to 59, we call it a stage 3. 60 to 89, we call it stage 2, and greater than 90. You can still have kidney disease with a GFR greater than 90 if you have proteinuria or if you have any other abnormalities, structural abnormalities. But anyway, so the reason why I'm bringing it up because today we're talking about acute kidney injury. I should probably change the name of this slide to the nephrology. Acute kidney injury is called these days because it's a more descriptive way of uh, um, putting it. And also, the word renal failure is intimidating because you feel like, oh, this is my kidney, they're never going to come back. And we're going to learn today that some types of kidney injury are more, the prognosis is better than others. We're going to talk about that at the end. But, um, but the point that I'm trying to make is that those equations that, that came up with this classification from the National Kidney Foundation, they're useless in the setting of acute kidney injury. Why? Because the studies were done on very steady conditions. And it was a pretty large cohort of patients when they came up with this formula. I don't know if you heard about the DMRD, disease um, modified renal diet study. They looked into a large number of patients and they measured creatinines. And they also measured, at the same time, they did uh, nuclear medicine studies to better assess the, the renal function. And they validated the DMD, DMRD equation as the standard of care to, to measure the renal function. Uh, or Romero's equation, but however, again, those equations were calculated on pretty steady conditions and pretty steady um, diet, uh, because if you're a big meat eater, your creatinine is probably higher than, than a non-meat eater. So those are all those things that come. So for the purposes of this talk, we're not going to discuss GFR. So GFR, 
if, if the doctor tell you, oh, you're in kidney failure, and your GFR yesterday was 23 and now it's 15, that doesn't mean anything. That means it's like your creatinine is less than your, your kidney weight. Okay? So what do you guys learn in school about um, patient a patient with kidney injury? What did it tell you? Did you ever hear about these three renal, intrinsic renal, post renal? Okay, so I want, I want you guys to do the exercise with me. And then let's go again to the first paragraph. This is an old person that presumably he was relatively okay, creatinine of 1.3, probably at a stage where kidney injuries could be normal. But the UA was normal. And when they did it two days post op, he's pretty much his urine output dropped and his VON creatinine went up. And so, what, what do you think if we go over the differential of pre renal, intrinsic renal, and post extractive? How would you approach that? Like, in other words, what other information? Let's say I'm sending you to see this patient. Mm -hmm. You're in the hospital and you're attending, I'm sending you an announcement to go see this person. And what kind of information is useful for me in the So the first thing we wanna we wanna find out is like pre-renal. Pre-renal. How can you become pre-renal? Either because you're bleeding, right. you're perfusing, by right. the pre-renal perfusion, or because they kept you on PO and these doctors they were not they were not careful enough to give you IV fluids. Um, so you can definitely become pre renal. But we're telling the guy who underwent surgery, and if anything, these patients that go surgery, they always get a lot of fluid, and it's pretty unlikely. So is he bleeding? It's possible. So getting the hemoglobin, that probably rules it out. Rules it out. Um, also, looking at the blood pressure chart, we're going to have some. The, kidney, the kidneys are very sensitive organs. In fact, when something goes wrong, the kidney is one of the first organs that, that actually puts a hit. I'm going to give you an example of surgical disasters or sepsis, shock. You know, for many reasons, we have many different causes like cardiogenic shock, we have distributed shock, we have hypoglycemic shock. So all of those things, um, they, they have an impact on, on renal function. So as a doctor in the hospital, you're obligated to find out what happened in this hospital. And you review the chart. And even if you do a careful review of the chart, um, clinical studies show that in 50% of the cases, we can't even demonstrate hypertension. But the more likely cause of these patients to kidney injuries is hypertensive induced edema. We call that ATM. Have you guys heard about ATM? Okay. How, how, how do you think they're going to ask you on the boys if the chance of pre-pillion breaks? You guys remember like the UN sediment? What is the UN sediment cast? They, all, they love this question on the board. They probably know it. Yeah, it's a certain type of cast. Which one? It's very good. You're going to remember that it's the Mighty Brown. Mighty Brown. Yeah, Mighty Brown. No, that's ATN. You can go into ATN from a severe perenal state. You can develop ATN. But ATN is more like an intrinsic renal problem. And ATN can be caused for, for many different reasons, either because it became hypertensive or because the patient developed um, contrast induced nephropathy. Have you guys heard about that in contrast? You know, iodine? Mm -hmm. Iodine can be toxic to some patients, not, not all patients, but some patients. Um, it's like the, the, the highest risk factor is if you're old, is high, or if you end up having uh, diabetes with pre-existing kidney disease. Those patients are pretty high risk. The four patients, all diabetics with pre-existing kidney disease, um, and uh, the patients that are either with an unoptimized volume status because they are, they're either very dry or they're very wet, the patient will be complicated heart failure. Those patients, for sure, they're at risk of developing conscious induced nephropathy. And there's a fourth group, group, fourth group of patients which are patients with multiple myeloma. Sure, you heard about multiple myeloma, and recently we heard from the other gentleman on your board who was in the exact same thing. Okay, so, but again, the ultimate result on these patients is ATM, and on your boards, they're going to give you some sort of scenario where, you know, this guy was taking the wrong medication, or he became hypotensive, shocked, whatever, and they're going to show you a picture of the urine sediment, and if you've never seen it, I recommend that you guys write it down and see it, because you're going to get a question. Mighty brown cast is, is, is a pathognomonic of acute fibular necrosis. Mm. And why, why does it look muddy? Well, 
the physiopathology behind this is that the patients they have an ischemic injury to the tubules in the, the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney. It's, it stays relatively intact. It depends on the severe on the severity of, of the ATM. But in mild to moderate cases, usually the, the nephron is not involved. It's just the tubules, and there is a physiologic process of, of blocking up the tubules. And that's why the patient may go from an oliguric or an emeric phase. And if you take a look at the urine, I invite you guys when you go to mass for your run and everything, just take a look at the urine. The urine may look very dark and muddy. And if you were to take a piece, a sample of that urine, you would centrifuge it, you would put it on a slide, take a look at the microscope, you do multiple, multiple casts on these dark pigmented colored cells, and that's why it looks like mud. From the spotting on the tubes. So these patients actually they tend to recover. They say they say God forbid something like this happens to you or me. Chances are we're gonna recover because we don't have pre existing kidney disease. But uh, but an old gentleman or let's say a diabetic with pre existing kidney disease, those guys can actually go into permanent renal failure and we have to support them with that process. So so the way I think about it is like they call you, you're the kidney doctor on call, they call you. You're gonna analyze this patient. You're gonna get good history, history from the from the records. You're gonna look for blood pressure because hypertension is one of the most common ones. You're gonna look for um, nephrotoxic medications. So which nephrotoxic medications would you recommend? Like which drugs can you really help them with? Antidepressants are very good. What else can you recommend? Uh, the FDA actually recommends against the use of NSAIDs in anybody with any NSAIDs. Just, um, they have, we become very successful if we were to use an insect system. Like you guys are too young to, for this, but in the 1980s, I'm sorry, 1990s, there was a big uh, thing on the news with bios, and a lot of people were like that dying, dying from that sudden death, and that bios was taken out of the market, like multi million dollar lawsuits. And to this day, we only have one selective uh, cost inhibitor, which is Celebrex. But a lot of doctors are scared to prescribe that because we know that uh, we know that they have significance, especially in the other prescribe. Okay. Uh, which other medications do you guys recommend that we use in hospital? I told you one. Uh, iodine. Iodine. So it can be very toxic. I already told you four types of patients that can be at risk. Um, does that mean that we don't do puncture in those patients? No. We have to have some strategies to minimize the risk. For example, if the patient is dry, we hydrate them. If the patient is wet, we diarrhea them. If the patient is uh, uh, diabetic, you know, we, we, we give mucomis, although some studies show that mucomis is kind of useless, but it's harmless. So it's a risk benefit. Like everything in medicine, we always think about risk and benefits. So I always give it to the patients because I, I know I'm not going to harm the patient. When it comes down to a life and death situation, for example, a patient has a heart attack, diabetic kidney disease with broken in the ear, you know that they're likely to develop kidney injury. You just need to sit down with the patient and explain to them. If, they, if you go on dialysis, we can fix it. If you die from this, that's it. And then you have to, you know, the heart takes precedence over food. But you have to talk to the patient and you need to inform them that that's one of the things that we're doing. Like the other day, I had a patient, transplantation patient. She had a massive respiratory hemoglobin. She had a cancer, a kidney cancer. Massive respiratory hemoglobin. Her hemoglobin, by the time we found out, her hemoglobin was 2.8. And you know, kidney, all this stuff. She went into what kind of kidney trial? ATM. So yeah. it's really a shock. She went into ATM, she stopped urinating. And the radiologist called me, like, I have to give her contrast. Because they were going to embolize, and she was massively bleeding from her from her from arteries, and uh, he did what he did. Just called the family, called the family like this. Mom needs it. There's nothing you can do. She needs it. So you deal with the consequences of that. You know, contracts can be toxic. So what other medications do you guys recommend that can be toxic that we give to patients? There are plenty of medications. We don't use them very often, but like antibiotics, like aminoglycosides, like gentamicin. 
you know, if you use it cautiously or you use it, you know, you, you always, my advice to you guys is when you tap or you never use it, just call the front because that's all they do. That's all they do. They, they take care of uh, interaction, they take care of dosing, they know, sometimes they're a little psycho rigid because one thing is like being in the war zone and, and making decisions and another thing is like being in a computer trying to advise physicians. You have to negotiate with them. You know, I always respect your your opinion, but sometimes they're like, you know, I feel this kind of like you know, just negotiate with them. And for the most part, they always they always help. But um, um, but talk to the pharmacist because they're a useful resource, especially if you guys end up with any patients. Um, I rely a lot on pharmacists, and especially when patients go into renal failure. One of the things we need to do is what renally dose all medications. Why? Because a lot of these medications, they're not necessarily toxic, but they build up and they can cause serious side effects. Like for instance, if you if you have your patients on narcotics or your patient's taking trauma and the kidneys fail and you keep giving trauma, that patient's for sure going to become very, very confused or it's going to have, it's going to have a seizure, who knows. But one of the musts when you have a patient with acute kidney injury is you need to ring and dose all the medications. And I rely on the pharmacy, so I call the pharmacy and I'm like, please, Adjust everything for me, and they're very, very happy. Okay, so um, so physical exam, physical exam. Does physical exam help you figure out like what's the cause of your patient's kidney injury? Does it help? Absolutely. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like today, with all the technology that we have, and we rely on labs, and we make a lot of progress for the patients. It's like when I get called with a consult. Probably, I would say 95% of the time, I know what's going on without talking to the patient. But because you, you're you trained to understand numbers and patterns. And, and once you've done this for a while, you, you realize like it's, it's easier and easier to do it because you already know the patterns. But I'm going to tell you something. If you want to be an excellent physician, assistant, you have to listen to your patients. You have to understand what they're saying. Some doctors are not patients. You listen to your patient, you're likely to come up with a reason for the kidney failure. They may tell you, you know what, doctor, I haven't eaten anything for five days and I've been vomiting. You already know they're pretty for reading. You don't even need to look at the numbers and you already have other causes. Same thing, I'm having terrible diarrhea, or I've been using ibuprofen, like then I'm having this horrible pain, and I've been using ibuprofen for five tablets a day, a day in the middle of my beach. You already know what's causing the problem. So talk to your patients. Physical exam wise, it's very helpful. Volume, volume status assessment. Have you guys done a little bit of volume assessment? Like, like looking for edema yeah, or uh, JVD? Yeah. yeah, so that's that's a skill that you guys need to develop. Listening to the patient. So let's talk about that a little bit because that's also on the checklist that you sent me. Uh, volume status. Um, what are the things that you look for? Let's, let's talk about a patient in the CHF. So what are the things that you look for? Serial and And what do you look for peripheral edema? Uh, you can check in the legs, you can do like pato, the jugular, Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. And in a patient that's being fed back, and especially in my new age patients, they, you know, they're very hypoglycemic. As you know, albumin is responsible for, for the oncotic pressure and keeping fluid inside you. So look for the upper thighs and look for the sacral area. So I, I always, as a habit, I always bring the patient up and with my hand, press hard on the sacral. So we, exactly. So that's that's an important aspect because if you if you have a patient a bed bound patient you may miss that and you don't do it. Mm. Just looking for edema. Looking for edema, like peripheral edema. So we look for you know severe edematous states. You can see obvious signs like including facial. Like a typical characteristic of the nephrotic patient, the renal patient, is that they they have high bleed edema. They have an asarca. You know you can have an asarca for many different reasons, but one of them is renal. The renal and the especially, they, they come up with uh, high lead edema. Um, but you can also have an asarca from renal, from liver disease. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen a cirrhotic patient, but these patients, they tend to have like edema all over. But, mm -hmm. but on exam, they also have features of cirrhosis. You guys remember some of them? Features of cirrhosis, what are the things that you look for? Cirrhosis. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. What else do you look for? Anxieties. Shifting dullness. Is that the uh, Medusa? Medusa, yeah, Medusa, 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 Medusa. Medusa. 
Very good. And that has to do with estrogen metabolism. Darmy, look at the cricket. Oh! We got it. You know, Catch like, it. Maybe it has renal failure. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> dialysis. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, those are the. Um, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> So I was telling you that the estrogens, uh, they don't get metabolized. Uh, they're metabolized in the liver. So they have liver failure, these patients, they may have gynecomastia. And they can also have the telangi telangiectasias. Yeah. And if you take a look at the breathing pattern pattern, these patients, they develop like a rocker for that colosis. They breathe very fast and very shallow. If you look at them and you do a blood gas, they, they, they have metal in terms of perfect apoptosis. Okay, so volume status is very useful. So if you look at, let, let's put the opposite scenario. The patient is very dry. What are the things that you look for? To so assess that for dry. Mucus. The mucous membrane, you know, in kids, if you end up taking care of your kids, they cry, they can have tears, tears. with no tears, they can have some canines, they can have the skin type. The skin type is very good. So all, all those things are useful. So to answer the question that I asked, yes, it's very important. Physical exam can reveal these things. So if you're examining, examining an 83-year-old, what's common in 83-year-old males? Plastic PPH. Right? PPH. So you always do a good exam and you feel the you know the bladder. You can tell if somebody is in pain or something. They're, most of the times they're very uncomfortable. But you know, you guys are gonna learn very quickly that diabetics, diabetics are box of surprise. You know, they can present with MIs with no pain. I've had two patients with cholecystitis with no pain. And that's unheard of in a in a non diabetic. Why is that? Nerve ending, nervous um, oh, peripheral okay. neuropathy. So those patients, they may, they may not even be able to communicate, especially the elderly. They may get confused. So if you have an elderly person, always feel the bladder. Always, you know, it's easy to, you know, you, if you feel that they have a, um, what's called a global physicality, like urine retention, you can, you can feel it, and you can tell right away. And how do you rule that out, by the way? How do you rule that out? What do you tell your nurse? Let's say I have the 83 year old there and I want to rule out of suction. Like PPH mm -hmm. or suction? PPH or suction. What kind of test do you do? You don't have an ultrasound. Reach out. Because no, because it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. You do a digital rectal exam? You do a digital rectal exam and yes, it's enlarged, but that doesn't rule it out. Mm -hmm. Prostate is enlarged. So what do you do? You don't have an ultrasound machine because that's the easy one. There's <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of urine there. Put a little catheter. Okay. You know, we call that an assessment of post post body residuals, post body residual assessment. So it's easy. You just assess it. You you ask the patient to void. Most patients are able to void. Maybe a little bit. Some of them they don't void anything. And then you ask the nurse to advance the catheter. If the patient has anything greater than 150, some textbooks says like greater than 200, you have a patient with a section. And that may be the reason. And I always say maybe the reason is because you you could very well have pre-renal, intrinsic renal, and post-renal mm -hmm. post at the same time. You know, one doesn't exclude the other. In fact, most of the times in my, in my business, acute kidney injury is multifactorial. And it's not just one cause. It's just a combination of different things. But it's easy to roll it out. Um, in females, obviously, they don't have prostates, but uh, they can also present with... Um, with uh, Obstruction. Um, perfect example is the severe diabetic. They develop a pretty, pretty on, ominous complication of diabetes, which is diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And they can develop a neurogenic black. So that's why you see the must. If you're in the hospital and you need to roll it out, there's only one way of doing it: just put a catheter. If you don't want to force to the patient, if you have the resource, yes, you can do that. You'll be able to do that. But diabetic, it's a must to do a bladder ultrasound. Again, it's, it's quite common. And how do you treat these patients with neurogenic black? What's the treatment? Orbis. If you think about it, yeah. just imagine if you're, if you're a male or a female, whatever. For males, it's a lot more uncomfortable, but a female is, is actually more embarrassing for them because they, they have to have somebody doing it for them. The males, they can still do it because the female won't be able to see you with her. So it's always the partner and the husband, and it's very sad because they have to advance. Imagine like the violation of your privacy in 
every single day. Like they have to report by ten twenty. Oh. Otherwise, they develop UTIs. Why don't we just leave when we don't ever leave the capital? We don't ever leave the capital. Because it'll it's, develop a stay it, there. Oh my the, the, the risk of leaving an involuntary catheter is, is, is higher than do, doing CICs. Plain intermittent self catheterization. That's called CIC. I don't know if you've ever watched CIC, but no. you know, for males, I'm sure you've seen those commercials like Medicare, and all yeah. those other things. So they send, send you the kid, and it's kind of, they, they, they have to do it four times a day, four times a day at least. I know most patients are not complying with the recommendation, but that's what they're recommending. Yeah. Pretty, pretty awful. Think about that, you just report what you need to rule. Yeah, pretty bad. So that's how you rule it out. Obstructed, or if you have an ultrasound, uh, but you can still be obstructed if you have nothing in your bladder. The obstruction may be coming from the upper urinary tract, the uterus. Mm -hmm. So they may give you the classical scenario that I may give you in the boards. It's a female with cervical cancer. Fortunately, you guys live in an era where cervical cancer is less and less common. You know, my grandma died from, died from cervical cancer. Uh, my mom tells me that she's only sick when she does her mom. But nowadays we don't we don't see it very commonly because we do screening. I think the last ten years they came up with with the HPV vaccine and and it's a disease that is it's, it's getting eradicated fortunately. But the classical scenario is they're asking your boards uh, for a female with with cervical cancer or metastatic cervical cancer they can present you with, with acute kidney injury from obstruction from bilateral ureal obstruction. Those patients, they usually need to be catheterized. You know how to call? Just stick the liquid in. Nephrostomy. Nephrostomy is easy for those patients to be able to catheterize. Otherwise, they, they, I mean, they go into dialysis, they go into tubes, but. So, yeah, so, or you can have, you have a solitary functioning kidney and you have a kidney stone. You can present with, with drop in the urine out, acute kidney injury. It's easy to fix. It's called urology. They put a stent. They fix it. Uh, but you can also you can also see this kind of scenario in bilateral kidney stones. For instance, patients with with very high uric acid, they can uh, in that uh, develop in Hi. Hello. Hi. What's going on? I want the pharmacy. Just the pharmacy. Yeah. So those patients, those patients can. Can it definitely develop a bilateral kidney stone like K? Tomorrow we're probably going to talk about kidney stone. You know, the composition of kidney stone can be, can be anything. can be uric acid, can be calcium, can be phosphate, can be struvite. But patients with bilateral kidney stones, it can be from uric acid, like high uric acid state. For instance, a patient with cancer. Have you guys heard about tumor lysis? Tumor like syndrome, mm -hmm. so these patients can develop like severe hyperuricemia, and the the hyperuricemia can deposit form crystals, and sometimes they can form like obstruction. How much the so that's that's part of the differential. So obstructive renal failure is less common, but still is part of the differential, and you have to roll it out. And it's simple to roll it out. Simple and cheap. That's how I call it. Simple and cheap. So. To give you an idea of like the, the etiology of uh, acute kidney injury, you're gonna think this way: ATN, 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 and maybe the rest. But you have to figure out why ATN, because ATN is the ultimate physiopath, but it, it doesn't explain the the cause, because your patient may be bleeding, or your patient may be getting an epitoxic medicine, or your patient may be. Um, Maybe having some sort of um, no. um, then we insult to the kidney that, that we need to identify the, the, the cause. But then there are other less common causes of kidney failure, kidney injury. Um, and that's when we move into the intrinsic diseases of the kidney, which is a whole nephrology textbook. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to cover some of them later in the second case. But um, what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make is that. In the hospital setting, when you get consulted, it's probably likely related to ATM. And other things, of course, you have to think out of the box. Uh, but the chances of like having a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis are pretty 
are pretty minimal in-house, okay. you know what I mean? And it's almost okay. always that we did to the patient. If you pay, pay attention to the patients that go in the hospital with normal kidney function, and they end up developing worsening kidney function in-house, the answer is then go back, review the chart, see what's, what we've done for this person, blood pressure-wise, medication-wise, and you're going to be able to tell whether or not, yeah. you know, what the cause of the kidney, kidney injury is. All right, why don't you go ahead and read the second paragraph then. Do that. Okay, the patient has nice symptoms of congestive heart failure. Yeah. He has not been okay. Okay, he has not been extremely thirsty over the past over the last several days. He has had difficulty urinating over the past several years with a weak stream and nocturia three to four times per night. His doctor told him he had he had BPH but no therapy was given. The patient uh, denies leg pain or flank pain. The hospital chart is reviewed which showed the patient had significant bleeding in the preoperative period with several episodes of hypotension with systolic blood pressure in the 80 range. Just episode. This episode lasted yeah. for short periods of time, less than five minutes, and returned to normal blood pressure after the pe after that period. His urine output was 700 milliliters a day immediately after surgery and dropped to 200 to 300 milliliters a day over the past two days. That's what, pretty little, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys know what the normal urine output is? 1500? Yeah. yeah. Like, depends on the fluid intake, but probably, would say, I would say no less than one liter. And definitely it can be even over two liters. But uh, this patient is definitely polyuric. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see. For the three days after surgery, his total fluid balance is positive three liters. His only medication post operatively was analgesia uh, with dilaudid. He did receive one dose of ceph cephalothin uh, preoperatively and no. None since that time. Cephalotin is a first generation cephalotin. Oh, okay. uh, that's what we do for antibiotic prophylaxis. Oh, we'll talk about that for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, most surgeons do it. There's only one time, one time dose. Okay, so, very good. So, I gave you a lot of information there. Um, does that historical information affect your differential? Okay, is it possible that may, may be obstructed, like yes, like yeah. prostatism? Mm -hmm. It's possible, right? Mm -hmm. He's an old dude and he had like nocturia, which is pretty common, by the way. What do you recommend your patients with nocturia, by the way? How do you make their lives easier? So you give them simple advice. You tell them, drink less, drink less nocturnal fluid intake. Yeah. You know, nothing after 5 p.m. I mean, it's pretty hard to follow that recommendation, but, you know, it's your quality of sleep, right? And um, less caffeine. That also helps. Okay. So, so what is your different? What is your more likely diagnosis at this point? After with the things that you read. Combination of renal and That will be ATM then. That's intrinsic renal. The ATM prevenal is more like, like having diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Yes. You go in the hospital, they give me a new fluid, and my kidneys are yeah. fixed. Uh, Whereas ATM is more like there's some damage sustained to the tubules. Okay. And the, the recovery process yeah. may take days to weeks or may not even happen. How do you know that the bleeding is in the tubules and not, because you said pre renal was decreased in perfusion, so maybe it's bleeding yeah. somewhere else? or like Yeah, no. Invariably, patients with yeah. patient bleeding, invariably they become pre renal because they get less renal perfusion. Mm -hmm. But when that's a sustained state, oh. like in other words, like, okay. like it happens over a period of hours, it can be severe enough to cause a more severe degree of kidney impairment, which is ATM. Yeah. So most patients bleeding, vomiting, they, they may have some pre renal component, but uh, if you combine that in addition to the hypertension, I'm pretty sure those kidneys, okay. they had an ischemic injury, mm -hmm. ATM. So mm -hmm. acute bleeding is pre-renal, sustained bleeding is ATM? Yeah, I would way say, way I would think like if, if they mention the word bleeding, think about ATM. Okay. Because the bleeding is not going to turn around very quickly. By the time the, the patients are diagnosed and treated, the kidneys are very sensitive organs. We have to remember that. The kidneys mm -hmm. are sensitive organs. Whenever some sepsis stirs, the kidneys are one of the first ones that go down. And they respond also very quickly, depending on the severity and the duration of the, of the insult. Okay? So... And he got the analgesic. But what kind of analgesic is that? Well, it says with dilaudid, so I don't know. 
it could is that could it just be an opiate or is it an analgesia like NSAID? Yeah, they they only give her an opiate. Um, so the opiate doesn't cause acute injury. But it could be that. It could be that. That's the thing. So that's why you have to be smart because these events are evolving as we speak, and then the patient's clinic status depends on the interventions that you take. So whenever you you it becomes part of your thinking. Like every time I have a patient with kidney injury, the first thing I do before I sign up, I review the medication, and I say like this needs to come out, this needs to come out. Just part of the part of the care of these patients. Okay, go ahead and Maria read the third paragraph. The patient's physical exam showed temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, respiratory rate of 14, blood pressure 130 over 90, pulse rate of 82, with no orthostatic changes. His mucous membranes were moist, neck pain, neck pains were one centimeter above the sternal angle. The patient's lung exam was cleared auscultation and percussion without rails. Cardiac exam has a normal S1, S2 without S3 or murmurs appreciated. The patient's abdomen was soft with slight tenderness over the surgical scar. No ecchymosis were noted. The patient had no CVA tenderness or ecchymosis present in the back. A Foley cath was placed in the patient at that time, which showed approximately 50 cc's of urine in the patient's bladder. So, how does this physical exam help you determine the cause of the acute kidney injury? What is this neck pains? What, what is that? Underneath the temperature of the respiratory. Neck pains or one centimeter. What is that? Oh, no, no. What I meant to say was the. the oh, neck veins. The neck veins. Neck veins. That's, that's what I meant to say. So he's not volume overloaded, right? Right. That's what I mean. And then. And he's not dehydrated. Yeah, and he's not dehydrated. And he's not obstructed, right? Because right. you right. measure. We talked about 150. Or greater than 150. Some urologists is not even 200, just 250. But anyway, as a nephrologist, like anytime I see 150, that's, to me that's that's retention. So I already told you on physical exam. I already told you that he's not uh, pre-renal. I'm sorry, he's not post-renal. He's not volume or right. yeah. So basically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much, like I said, ATN, ATN, ATN. Yeah. And then we're going to talk about another cause in a minute. So go ahead, uh, Carrie. Hey, Carol, Carrie? Kelly. 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 All right, a fresh specimen of the patient's urine is examined under the microscope and showed numerous epithelial cells in oh. brown degenerating cellular cast. No crystals or white blood cells were noted and only rare RBCs were present. The urine sodium was 40. Urine specific gravity 1.01. UP BUN creatinine on the fourth day after surgery were 52 for BUN and 3.5 for creatinine. Uric acid was 9.2. A renal ultrasound is done. Kidneys are normal in size and no signs of obstruction present. Okay, so he's getting worse, right? Tell him. Look at his numbers. Um, BUN went um, yeah. 40 up to 52, so it's increasing Sorry. and creatinine, creatinine also. Yes, and we're talking about day, day fourth, right? No, the fourth day? Yeah. Right. The first one was how many days after? Two days after. Two days after. Yeah. So, so it's getting worse. And then this guy's making little urine, right? We talked about like a normal urine apple, and he only made like 200 and 300. That's pretty negligible, right? So do you want to keep giving him fluids? Do you think fluids are going to help him? Yeah, but you know, having said that, most doctors they give you fluids to these patients, like they feel these fluids are going to help in any way. And they've done many studies and it doesn't help. In fact, if you don't pay attention to the volume study, you're, you're doing a disservice to your patient because at the end, you're probably going to end up accelerating the dialysis initiation. And is there a magic pill for ATM, by the way? Or is there a magic treatment for ATM? No, it's supportive care. Supportive care means avoiding hypotension, uh, avoiding nephrotoxins, and avoiding, you know, like the volume complications of kidney kidney failure. If you keep giving this guy like 100 cc or 150 cc an hour for four days, he's already volume positive. You call me three liters, right? Mm -hmm. Three points. And so you're you better stop with IV fluids, otherwise the guy's gonna start like doing. Funny, and you're gonna end up putting like cold blue thing to your patient and putting on dialysis. So, yeah, so basically, with this guy, we all agree that he's going into ATN. Mm -hmm. um, the renal ultrasound 
Why do we do a renal ultrasound in renal failure, guys? What's the purpose of doing a renal ultrasound? Looking for obstruction? Yeah. It's Structural abnormalities of the kidney in 95% of the times, hydronephrosis. Whether or not the patient has hydro. Does it, come, does it happen very often? No. Again, most common is pre-renal and ATM. That's the, most, the two most common causes of kidney injury. Pre-renal, it resolves very quickly. ATM, it takes days to weeks, sometimes months, and sometimes it may happen. But that's basically the difference. What's the normal uric acid level? Less than 6.8, less than 7. So this person also has high uric acid. And why does that happen? Tumorized syndrome. It can happen in many things. It can happen in tumorized syndrome. Like it can happen in kidney disease because the uric acid is cleared by the kidneys. Okay. Um, mm. It can happen in yeah, in leukemias. It can happen in patients with gout. I'm sure you've seen. You're going to see a lot of gout. So if you have a patient with gout coming to you and you don't have labs, make sure you check labs because you don't know what's what's first, the, is the chicken or the egg. It may be the kidney disease leading to gout. And if the patient hasn't had any labs, please don't give them NSAIDs because you're, again, you can you may be giving NSAIDs to somebody who's already in kidney failure. So, so if somebody with gout does that predispose them to have kidney disease. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Somebody yeah. with kidney disease is predisposed to have gout. But not the other way around. Very high uric acid can cause kidney injury, but it's not as commonly seen. Yeah, so you can have acute, there's two types of kidney disease associated with high uric acid. One is called acute uric acid nephropathy, which is what we were just discussing about the position of crystals in a mm -hmm. obstructive ATM. And there is another way of injuring the kidney, which is it's called chronic uric acid nephropathy. And that's not a common entity. And, and in fact, we don't really understand the prevalence of that entity because it's so common to have elevated uric acid that we don't biopsy patients with high uric acid and kidney disease because we assume it's probably the kidney disease causing the hyperuricemia and not the opposite. Okay. So do uh, we give them allopurinol? We give them allopurinol or ulyric or we give them, you know, there's a pretty powerful medication these days to bring down the uric acid very quickly. But for the most part, most patients, they get very well controlled with allopurinol. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, but for their pain, you know, usually you would give them the methicillin because they can't. Exactly, that's why I want you to check labs. If your patient has, if you don't check labs, let's say this patient comes in with gout, very classic gout, like podagra, pretty guy in a lot of pain, you don't have any labs and you're prescribing the methicillin, that's malpractice. Yeah. You have to check labs because how are you going to give him the methicillin? In other words, you're just treating a symptom. That's what pharmacists do or people without any medical knowledge do. You just give medications to alleviate pain without getting a diagnosis. So you have to check labs. If you don't have labs, for somebody with gout, that's, that's just not good. And then you, you'd order in the prescription or whatever afterward, after afterward. Yeah. You can manage the pain with opiates. You know, like if you work in the urgent care setting, there's some medications that are urgent care friendly. Like for instance, on lodipine, if you have high blood pressure, it's pretty harmless. You don't need to know the labs mm -hmm. before or after. But if you're going to prescribe an ACE inhibitor or a thiazide or a loop diuretic, mm -hmm. you need to have labs. It's a must. If you do, if you prescribe with a labs, it's on you. If something happens, it's on you because the patient is going to come with a sodium of 105 and they're going to tell, like, why didn't you check labs? It's just common sense. But um, having said that, like, the opiates are pretty urgent care friendly because, you know, they're not, you know, other ramifications of prescribing opiates because we have a lot of people going to urgent care. But, you know, you're going to be required to sign up for Cures, what's the name of that thing? Cures, which is the database in the state of California where you can. In, in less than a minute, you can actually verify somebody's um, prescription uh, history, opiate prescription history. So that, that, that's also helping a lot of, uh, um, uh, eliminate a lot of the abuse that we see in the urgent care setting. But opiates, for instance, for management of pain is very good. Like you don't want to have your pain waiting for an hour for those labs. Just give them a little bit of oh, something, an opiate or something. And if they truly have gout and they have kidney disease, you don't give NSAIDs. The treatment of choice is steroids, prednisone, they respond very well. If it's truly gout, if you give them prednisone, something like 20 milligrams a day for five days, that's sufficient to control the gout pain. If you if you don't want to use steroids, because whatever, the patient is diabetic or he's declining, uh, you can use colchicine, which is very effective as well. In 
fact, if he doesn't respond with, if he doesn't respond to colchicine, you may want to reconsider your diagnosis because you may be dealing with something else and not have it. And, and for long term, you use allopurinol and one of these medications with one year fast. Okay, so we talked about how we're going to treat him, and then on day six, what are you going to admire? Sure. On day six, after surgery, the patient's BUN is 68, creatinine is 4.1. His urinary volumes are between 300 to 500 mils per day. Serum electrolytes are sodium 142, potassium 4.2, chloride 98, uh, bicarb 23. The patient is started on fluid and salt restriction, but he remains oligoeric. By day eight, the patient's BUN is sure, 85, mm -hmm. creatinine is 6.3. Is there anything else you would do to manage this patient? No He's no getting clearly worse, right? Well, I would refer to you. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done that probably on day four. Maybe day two. <laughs> So, but my question to you guys is, when do you start dialysis? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Um, oh, right. Is there a number? Is there a magic thing for dialysis? What do you guys think? And how the patient's doing? What is right? that? Because I'm, I'm assuming each patient would be different on Very when they good, start. Yeah. Each patient would be different, and each doctor will make different decisions. Some of them will be cool, some of them will be great. <laughs> so, the, the, the point that I want I want to make is that they teach us that there are some indications for dialysis, but you can make that decision without seeing the patient because it's, it's, it's actually a decision that you make after you review the labs, you review the urine output. If this patient is already picking up a little bit, it's going 300, now it's, they said 500, that means that he's making a little bit more urine. If you don't see an increase in the urine output, your patient is in trouble, right? So that every day, it's very important that you get accurate eyes and nose. That's, that's one of the reasons why we follow, uh, you know, we put folds in these patients to, to make sure we account for every drop of urine. But also you want to take a look at the labs. If the labs are fine, if your patient has pretty normal labs, you know, there's really no rush to start someone on dialysis. Because we all get taught in medical school that you think about hyperkalemia, that's one of the most serious complications of acute kidney injury. But you also think about metabolic acidosis to the point that these patients are getting, they're getting tired. You know, they're, they're breathing. You know, the lungs try to compensate for the metabolic acidosis by blowing out, um, I'm sorry, by, by retaining the CO2. And the, I'm sorry, by blowing out the CO2. So these patients, they, they end up, that's an indication for that is when they're already having like compromising the mental status or when they, when, they, when they're going into respiratory failure, very clearly you need to put this patient on dialysis. But I'm giving you pretty normal labs on this individual. I told you that bicarbonate is 20, 23, that's well, normal. I'm giving you a potassium of 4.2, 4 that's probably better than mine. And sodium is okay, and he's making some urine, he's not in respiratory distress, so there's no need to put him on dialysis unless you have some financial interest in doing that. So obviously you can, in these days where you see a lot of pressure from these church planners and care, you know, the hospitals, you go in and say, hey, Dr. Why are you going to send this patient out? So I'll tell you something about this patient. I wouldn't send a patient home with a rising creatinine. Why? Because you don't know. You know. Probably chances are he's going to turn around, but what if he doesn't? And you're not checking daily labs, so you, you're not able to make decisions. So the, the decision about starting someone in dialysis is a daily assessment of the volume status, the urine output, and the electrolytes. And obviously the patient's preference. Sometimes the patients tell you that there's no way I will take dialysis. That's that's enough to write it off. And then just try to manage the patients. But again, I already told you guys there's no magic pill. Right? I explained this to you, it's just supportive care and your your own your own ability to heal and and, and get rid of the renal failure. Okay. Go ahead, Sarah, on day nine. Okay, on day 9, postoperatively, the patient's urine output begins to rise to 1 liter per day, and by day 11, it is up to 3.5 liters per day. The patient's BUN is up to 92, creatinine 6.9 on day 11. Okay, so what is notable in this paragraph? It's being, right? Yeah. 
It was like a lot. A lot, so it's great. Actually, this guy is like, they didn't read all that IV fluid, so they kept giving him for four days before somebody said, like, oh, this guy's gonna stop breathing. So he was positive four liters, so the, that fluid needs to come out. So that's one of the complications of ATN, and it's called post ATN diuresis. So the post ATN diuresis uh, can cause two things. It can cause, or can cause three things. It can cause hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, and hypovolemia when they're eating a lot. But my general rule, if your patients are eating and drinking, let them be. The body will tell, you know, his brain or her brain will tell how much they want, how much they need. So, you said hypomagnesium, hypokalemia. Hypokalemia, hypo or like they become hypovolemic oh, when they urinate a lot. But, you know, again, if your patient is bed bound, I try to match them or I try to support them. But my preference is always just let them fly. Why? Because I need to know what it's safe to me, for me to send this patient out. If he's peeing five liters and I'm giving them five liters, I don't know. How am I going to know? The only way of knowing it is just let it be. Cut it down, have the patient eat and drink, and if they're holding on to the electrolytes and the volume status, they're good to go. Let them be as in stop giving them the IV fluids? Yeah, I, you know, I don't give IV fluids if they're eating or drinking. In fact, if the patient stops peeing, you need, to, you need to take those IV fluids out because you're only causing, okay. causing harm. Yeah. Okay, why don't you read the last one? On day 12? Yeah. Let's see, on day 12, the patient's urine output begins to decrease to 1.5 1, 1. 1. 5, 5 liters. liters per day. His BUA and creatinine begin to fall. Fluid and salt restrictions are discontinued. The patient is uh, discharged from the hospital on day 14 and followed up as an outpatient. His BUA and creatinine return to normal three, three weeks after surgery. Okay. So that last paragraph <laughs> explains the natural course of ATN. Most patients have a favorable prognosis. Some patients, especially the ones with pre-existing kidney disease or, or they have multiple comorbidities, they, they won't recover. But for the most part, most patients go to the previous um, renal function that they had. But some, of, some other patients, they may, they may be left with residual damage. And that residual damage may be permanent, not, not, not necessarily something that you can bring back. Okay? Any questions? If you start needed to start dialysis, is that any prognostic factor for uh, recovery? Reco yeah. yeah. Excellent question. Yeah, mm -hmm. they've done some studies, and they, they, they some some studies suggest that patients with dialysis they have a delayed uh, recovery of the renal function. Um, but in general, we every nephrologist has a different way of approaching it. The safest thing to do is just to make sure your patient's electrolytes are stable. Your patient's volume status is stable, and if they need it, they need it. You know, it also depends on how you prescribe dialysis because some patients, they, some that like everything else, like you probably heard that dialysis patients are crazy. I don't think they're crazy. It's just a lot of the non-compliant people end up on dialysis. So that mm -hmm. that gives you a falsely elevated prevalence of mental disease in the dialysis units. It's just the non-compliant, just common sense, right? If you don't listen, you're going to end up on dialysis. And that happens with a lot of the diabetics. So at the same time, when you start someone on dialysis, I teach them that I need their help to be able to, to do well on dialysis. I'm going to give you an example. Dialysis patients, they have a very, um, they have to adhere to a sodium and a fluid restricted diet. Some patients, they feel because they're already on dialysis, I'm going to eat whatever. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because if you gain a lot of weight in between your treatments, most patients in dialysis, they end up, they stop urinating after a while. It can be months, it can be years, but universally, most patients, they stop peeing at one point. So if you, if you understand that concept, you understand that you're 100% dependent on the dialysis machine. So if you still pee and you want to preserve your residual kidney function, the best thing you can do is to keep it, keep it simple from the fluid perspective and from the sodium perspective. Why? Because when I start using the ultrafiltration feature from the dialysis equipment, I'm, I'm harming your kidney, your residual kidney function. And this is an important concept that I always emphasize to students. Being a dialysis patient doesn't mean that you don't have residual kidney functions. And they've done many studies, and those are the patients that do well. 
If you have residual kidney function, you enjoy from better quality of life because it's always the, the common sense that if I still pee, I can drink, right? Or a little bit more. If I don't pee, I, I, there's so much I can drink. You know, the recommendation for a neurotic patient is, is one liter in a 24-hour period. And that's pretty little. I mean, it's like two bottles, right? And most patients are having a hard time adjusting to that recommendation. But if you want to do well in dialysis, you need to do that. Otherwise, have to use the machine to remove a lot of fluid. And that ultrafiltration kills the residual kidney function. Mm -hmm. So by the same token, if you, if you have residual kidney function, you enjoy, I already told you, better quality of life, better, better phosphorus control because the nephrons are still functioning. The secondary hyperparathyroidism, which is one of the renal complications, is not as severe in patients that they still urinate. And, and, and survival. You know, many studies have shown that dialysis patients that urinate, they have a much, much lower mortality rate. So sometimes the patients don't listen. Even if you tell them all these facts and you give them studies and everything, they do whatever. I recently lost a patient. She was gaining, which is a ridiculous, a very obese woman. She was gaining between 10 to 11 kilograms in between her treatments. Where her, the recommendation is to gain no more than 2 kilograms. She was doing, she was exceeding the recommendation by 5, 6 times. She died. So dies suddenly. And that's what happens. Patients that don't adhere to fluid restriction, they do very poor. So they feel like, oh, dialysis is going to fix my life. You have to realize, guys, that the kidneys work 24-7. And it works pretty, pretty impressive job because you have a calculator there. It's telling you. So just how many minutes do we have in a 24-hour period? We have like 1480, right? Let's say that 1480, you're going to multiply that by 100. Let's say the normal renal function, 100 mLs per minute. So you have 148 liters of blood flowing in a 24-hour period. That's like 50 gallons of blood flowing in the kidneys in a 24-hour period. If you think about that, dialysis only gives you three to four hours, three times a week, and very suboptimal. So when we put up someone on dialysis, it's the equivalent of a patient that's going to die we put them on the stage five, and he's gonna be able to live. But the point that I'm trying to make is a very suboptimal way of living, because we, we don't get even close to the, the level of efficiency and functionality that a human kidney has. So dialysis is very suboptimal. The patients, I, I always explain that concept to them, so they understand early on in the game that if you don't listen, you're not gonna feel well. And when you hear about like, oh, dialysis patients are crazy, again, it's because they end up there very common compared to the good listeners, okay? Very good. We have another case, what time is it? Mm -hmm. The time it seemed that after he noted both his legs had become swollen. Over the past several months, he noticed the swelling had increased over his entire body. He was focused 20 pounds in his gait over that period. So what are the probable causes of total body edema in, in the patient? What do you guys know about total body edema? We also call that an sarca, right? Very good. What else? Nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome. Very good. What else? Oh, it was a little bit there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what else? Liver failure. Malnutrition, right? Or malabsorption. But there's some other states, like severe hypothyroidism. You guys remember the myxedema? Um, myxedema. They give you like a non pit edema. So that's another entity in the differential of total, total body edema. So the easy way to remember is heart, liver, kidney, severe hypothyroidism, malnutrition, and yeah, then we have differential like unilateral from a DVT or from some sort of like some sort of severe thrombosis. But for the most part, you're, you're pretty much covered with those four entities. Okay. And, um,
paragraph. Why don't you read the second paragraph? Okay. He has no history of heart disease and denies uh, PND, DOE, or orthopnea. He has no history of liver disease and denies a history of jaundice, dark urine, or alcohol use. He does not know of any exposure to any hepatitis and has no history of IV drug use. He was never told of any problem with his kidney as an adult or a child. His urine frequency is unchanged over the past two months. So, given this patient's history, is the likelihood of congestive heart failure or cirrhosis there, or what do you guys think? No. Nope. I already told you, like, PND, DOE, and orthopnea are, are very classic signs of kidney, I'm sorry, heart failure. Mm -hmm. um, what's the other one? Uh, Paracetamol, nocturnal dysphony. No. These patients that they wake up in the middle of the night, short of breath, and they open the window. That's that's a sign of a uncompensated heart failure. So you can enjoy your patients here and ask them that question. Do you wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air or having to open the window for air? Yeah. PND. Okay, so and I already told you that the other question. Yeah, he doesn't have really anything consistent with liver disease, right? No jaundice, no, no alcohol use, no hepatic toxins. No hepatic toxins. Okay, so what physical exam points should we focus on this patient? So, for your boards, if they have hypothyroidism, do not feed an edema. If they have malnutrition, you can see other signs of, you know, malnutrition, temporal wasting, muscle atrophy, you know, some sort of mal malabsorption or some sort of like, they give you some history of malabsorption, right, or some sort of malnutrition. Or heart failure, I think we discussed it with the other case, volume status. You know, you can also hear an S3 gallop in this patient when this heart. Um, hepatic dysfunction, we kind of covered everything already. And nephrotic syndrome, so you can see nephrotic syndrome. So go ahead, Marie, read the third paragraph. On physical exam, he appears grossly edematous and puffy. His uh, vitals, blood pressure 145 over 98, pulse 92, respiration 16, temperature 98.6. The patient's skin shows no signs of jaundice or telangiectasias. He has no signs of palmar erythema. His face shows swollen eyelids, but sclera are non-enteric. Uh, examination of the neck shows no signs of JVD and no thyromegaly. His lung exams are clear to auscultation and percussion, with the exception of decreased breath sounds and dullness to percussion in the bases. Cardiac exam reveals a non-displaced PMI, normal S1, S2, normal MERS, rubs, S3 or S4. Abdominal exam shows the liver to be approximately nine centimeters in size. No splenomegaly was appreciated. There were findings of shifting dullness to percussion of the abdomen. In the periphery, the patient had four plus pitting edema to the level of the sacrum and throughout both legs. The patient had no signs of gynecomastia testicular atrophy or parotid swelling. The patient's neurological exam was normal. Okay, does it sound like CHF? Mm -hmm. Do you see any cirrhosis on the things that they describe? Mm -hmm. They mentioned somewhere, like some, somewhere they said that he has a shift in dullness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you see that in, 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 in other states other than liver disease? Yeah, so you can have nephrogenic ascites. And you can have cardiogenic ascites. It's just a sign of ascites, but that doesn't mean that doesn't ascites is not pathog pathognomonic of liver disease. You have to investigate the reason of the ascites, and that's what we have to try to identify why they're having this. Okay, so so what what aspects of the of this physical exam that Mario read that may be consistent with nephrotic syndrome? Well, and I look very good. High blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Heart failure gives you the opposite, right? Very low blood pressure. What else? Mm. Clearly, fusion is actually. Yeah, pitting edema. Yeah, the edema can be, you know, not specific, but, oh. but these patients with severe nephrotic syndromes, they tend to have a lot of uh, clearly fusions. So that's probably the one of the reasons of these guys. And, what do you uh, see for fusions? I'm sorry. Fluid at the bottom, base of the lungs. Oh, fluid in your right, lungs. Sorry. Yeah. On the on the exam. 
and the swelling eyelids, like I told you, is frequently seen in patients with nephrotic syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, the scrubber swelling too, is that because it's all like the many areas? You can see, uh, yeah, that's another good point, like examine the patient's genitals to see if there's another area where you have a lot of fluid build up. Okay, so what kind of tests do you order to confirm the diagnosis? Yeah. Uh, UA. A UA, very good. Protein. So I can't tell you how many times I've been consulted to see a kidney patient with no UA. <laughs> would, you, would you call Dr. Benzer without an EKG to see one of your cardiology patients? No. So why would you call a nephrologist without a UA? <laughs> so always remember, if you're going to call a consult, call, please make sure you go UA. Okay, so, so why don't you go ahead, um, Kelly? The urinalysis revealed one plus proteinuria with a microscopic exam that revealed several waxy casts, a white fat body, nemocellular cast, one RBC, and one WBC per high-powered field. Electrolytes included BUN of 20, creatinine 1.3, other electrolytes, glucose, calcium, phosphorus, one mohol. 24 hours urine collection showed 12 grams protein and a creatinine clearance of 72 milliliters per milliliter. L2 were normal as was prothrombin time. The patient's albumin was 1.9 and serum cholesterol 670. Chest x-rays revealed bilateral curl effusions without signs of pulmonary venous engorgement or abnormalities in the cardiac silhouette. So what's the diagnosis? Nephrotic syndrome. And what's nephrotic syndrome? Hypoglycemia. Yeah, protein area. And what is the differential for nephrotic syndrome? Remember, it's a syndrome. Mm -hmm. We have to put in a name and a last name, right? Yes. It's like you're telling me your patient has a fever. Okay. Uh -huh. Fever, and what's the cause of the fever? Same thing oh, with nephrotic yeah. syndrome. You're giving me a, the name of a group of features that can be multi multifactorial, but we all agree that this is renal in origin, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you guys remember some of the differential diagnosis for nephrotic syndrome? I remember nephritic. IgA? IgA is more nephritic. Yeah, it's all nephritic. Oh, that is. Yeah. So it came down with this classification. Somebody did it. Honestly, one of my attendants used to say that this British nephrologist came up with this classification that's, that's not very useful when you think about the way you manage these patients because nowadays we biopsy these patients. We do a biopsy and we, mm -hmm. we can actually accurately have a name and a last name for these abnormalities. Mm -hmm. But back in the days, they were dividing them up based on on similarities, like massive amounts of growth in the urine, lip disturbances, um, bland urine sediment. Because somebody read that it was only three WBCs, or one WBC and one RBC. Mm -hmm. That's pretty bland. In other words, it's not nephritic. So those patients, he called them nephrotic. And he also made this requirement of having like more than 3.5 grams of protein urine. Honestly, that classification to me is useless, but if it makes it easier for you guys to remember, I think that's probably why it stayed over the years and we still teach it in med, med schools about these nephrotic and nephritic. But yeah, so there's many different causes of um, nephrotic syndrome. You guys remember? What's the most common cause? Diabetes. There you go. Thank you. Diabetes by far is 50% of the pathology of kidney failure in the world. Diabetic kidney disease is definitely something that that we have to rule out. We don't biopsy every patient with diabetes if it's very obvious that they've been diabetic, poorly controlled for a long time, and they present with a lot of proteinuria. Mm -hmm. Just we just have to assume that it's diabetic renal disease. And what's the prognosis for those patients? It's pretty bad, actually. It's very sad because every time I meet a diabetic with this degree of protein and evidence of diabetic end organ damage, I mean by that diabetic retinopathy or diabetic peripheral neuropathy or diabetic gastroparesis, you name it. These patients, I don't biopsy them because it does not gonna change my management. I have this at home. It's not gonna change my management, number one. And number two, invariably they're gonna end up on dialysis. So it's pretty bad. So when you get trace protein in a diabetic, should you be concerned? For progression, yeah, that's that's the first um, abnormality. You can you can stop that. That's why we use ACLBs. 
AC inhibitors, uh -huh. right. and that's basically perfect, perfect glycemic control, perfect blood pressure control. But once the the patient has full blown nephrotic syndrome, diabetic nephrotic syndrome, there's really so much you can do. You can perhaps delay the progression of renal disease, but your patient is likely to to become diabetic dependent or require a kidney transplant. And then when you get the trace, are they required to be on the ACE of the R indefinitely or until that point? As long as they're able to tolerate it. One of the problems with ACE is that it can give you hyperkalemia oh, or okay. cramp. Yeah. So as the kidney disease progresses, then it becomes a little problematic because the patients start having hyperkalemia and it gets to the point that you need to drop it. But for as long as you can tolerate it, and as soon as they become dialysis dependent, we give them back to us because it protects residual kidney disease. Let me, let me just get some water. They have water in the back, right? Yeah. In, in, in that little room? Nine, I think. Mm -hmm. From nine? Okay. I'm going to get some. I'll be back in a minute. I kind of missed some of what you were just saying. About the product? Yeah. Oh, I think I remember what you were talking about. Oh, okay. I don't know. I remember you said diabetic. No, I couldn't.